Hey, it's Joseph here. In my last video, I was comparing Sony ZV-E10 and Canon M50, which is what I'm shooting on, as well as Canon M6 Mark II. And then I just realized that content is gonna be way too long and wanted that one to be focused on the vlogging capabilities of the cameras. Therefore, I decided to create this video separately, focusing more on the remote shooting capabilities of the cameras. I'll be sure to leave the chapters in the video for you to find information easily and quickly. However, if you're here to learn about both Sony and Canon remote shooting methods, just sit back and relax as I will be doing somewhat of a detailed overview of the both. Based on what I have seen in multiple cameras from both Sony and Canon, the overall remote shooting experience was quite consistent within each brand of camera, Sony or Canon. Therefore, I decided to just label this video for the two to go over how to use each software whilst comparing them. Both Sony and Canon have a web page slash documentation that lists compatible cameras and their features in remote shooting. So I'll be sure to link those pages in the description. Be sure to check whether your camera is compatible with the things that I'm about to cover. Both Sony and Canon cameras can connect to your smartphones wirelessly. I've used this method of shooting when taking my family photos. Also, you can connect to cameras to your PC via Wi-Fi, either by turning the camera into a hotspot or by connecting your cameras into an existing network as well as the computer. One of the drawbacks of using wireless method is the fact that it drains your battery a bit quicker than connecting it wired. And I also wanted this video to be focused on the wired, the tethered method. Therefore, I will not cover wireless connection method specifically, but a lot of the areas that I will be talking about overlaps with the wireless methods. And please let me know if you would like to hear a bit about a specific area. And one last thing, I am mainly a Canon shooter currently at least and I have not used Sony's remote shooting software as long as I have on Canon. Therefore, I may not be as accurate or detailed on the Sony's, but what I'm about to say is true based on a couple months of trying Sony cameras, as well as if you guys have a specific question or something in mind that I have missed, then please let me know by leaving a comment down below. As a YouTuber, I primarily use cameras for videos. You can use remote shooting for pictures as well, but I'll be focusing more on the video capabilities as that's what I really do. The reason why I remote shoot on PC is because it is helpful to see the recordings on a large screen and also being able to control the camera from far away. To be fair, my camera isn't out of my reach as it is about three to four feet away it is actually mounted on the edge of my desk. However, it is just far enough where judging the picture on a tiny screen of the camera is somewhat difficult, as well as leaning forward and peering behind the camera is very disruptive to the overall shoot. As I do quite a lot of talking head style of video like this and screen recordings, it is much easier to see and do the shooting on the same spot. Plus, I shoot, edit, work in the same space because I can't really afford a completely separate space. And lastly, because the camera is already connected to the PC, I do not need to do additional things to transfer videos and photos that I take on my cameras to my computer. So no SD card insertion or USB cable connection after the shoot is necessary. The cameras are basically ready to shoot all the time and I just turn them on to begin shooting. My Canon M50 is almost permanently mounted onto my monitor arm. Therefore, I can adjust the angle depending on the type of the shoot although it stays mostly the same. And I've got several lights mounted on the desk to light up the scene whenever I intend to shoot. I've actually connected both camera and the lights in the same power strip mounted under my desk. Because my Canon M50 does not support in-body charging, I'm using a DC coupler, which is a dummy battery with a wire connected to my power strip. Therefore, I just turn on the switch for the lights and the camera and everything is ready to go. The microphone used to be boomed from the top just outside of the frame, but I've had a ton of issues when the 3.5 mm audio cable is extended about six feet. 
it just receives some sort of radio frequency noise in my audio regardless of the type of cables that I use. Therefore, I just use a friction arm to have it just outside the angle of the camera, just off the monitor arm. And since then, this has not introduced any noise at all. Occasionally, I will also add the teleprompter to my camera to be able to see the outline of the video easily, which also happens to cover the screen of the camera. So being able to see the picture on my monitors is definitely helpful. So let's start with Canon first as I am most familiar with this specific one. Okay, I have switched over to Sony camera now that is just sitting on top of my desk so that I can just talk into the camera but also showcase the Canon remote shooting. So the software that you will need for Canon remote shooting is called Canon EOS Utility. You can download the version 3 from Canon's website. Once you follow through the installation process, you can simply connect your camera via USB port on your computer, then launch EOS Utility. Under the camera settings, there are a few things that you can do such as firmware update and date time zone settings. I can return or go to preferences and then there are other things that you can set over here. There are a couple of things that I have done here for convenience is the startup action is set as show remote shooting screen. So instead of seeing that screen that you just saw, I will directly go into remote shooting screen and then automatically display quick preview window when I shoot the photos is what I have designated. And here I can now go to remote shooting option. Once you select the remote shooting, you'll see this dialog and I want to show you the changes that the values make. So let me open the live view by clicking on this button and now you'll be able to see me. And from the top, you can see that I currently have EOS M50 connected as well as the battery is noted here. And then and the leftover space in terms of the count of photos is here. And then here is a shutter button. Basically, as I hover over it, it will do the half press shutter button action and you can actually rotate the screen of the camera although that doesn't take impact on here but rather the rotation of the final version of the photo and then I can switch between autofocus versus manual focus and remote manual is now dialed in but I'm gonna shoot it back to the autofocus and then I can set different path for all of my photos to be downloaded to as well as the videos. And you can see that M for manual mode has been grayed out because I cannot change this value even though I click on it. Because Canon locks the shooting mode to whatever the mode dial is currently set to, I wish I can change that. And here the shutter speed, I can click on it and change it to a different value. I perhaps would like to make it slightly brighter. And I can use a scroll wheel on my mouse. That was a setting that I was able to choose on the preferences and I can change the shutter speed as well as the aperture. So I'm gonna park this one at slightly darker like this and then bring up the aperture and that will change as well. And also I can change the white balancing and choose different ones. Currently I'm set to this one here as well as the drive mode is set to two seconds so that I have a bit of time whenever I press the shutter to pose for the thumbnail of the video and the metering mode has been set to this one and then the ISO has been set to 200 for this specific scene and then I'm currently shooting as JPEG because I don't want to fiddle with raw files for thumbnail purposes and here I can click on this one to have the image saving location to either computer only or computer and camera memory card I actually set it to both so that I have a bit of contingency whenever a file gets lost on one side and this is only regarding photos not necessarily necessarily for videos and then going further down I have a couple of shooting menu that are available here 
I can choose different type of picture style and then the user defined detail set and then white balancing could also be set here and then I can go down to this flash control menu I don't really need to fiddle with that as I'm not using flash nor the live view slash movie function set because currently the exposure simulation has been enabled and I like that because I can immediately judge what is going on on my screen and then I have I've clicked on live view shoot to see the overall screen here but I can also go to the video mode which is basically now video capture mode and then you'll see that that has been switched over to video shooting and then my microphone is now being displayed over here and I can read it clearly on this side so the dialogue looks slightly different from video versus photo I cannot directly change the shooting mode however I can go in between currently I can't go back to the live view shoot until I close this dialogue and then switch over to live view shoot mode and here notice the microphone level is now gone but other things are pretty much similar however under other functions select and download or quick preview of the photo or I can go back to the preferences of different menu as well as going back to the main window but before I do that let me go over this side with the video shooting menu and once I am here you'll see the microphone level has come back as well as the camera tracking my face over there and then the live view section is over here the compose section is here although I don't really change anything that are over here so live view you can set different white balancing I really like this because if I go to the custom section and then press this to sample an area and in order for me to do white balancing correctly I can just hold up a piece of paper that is supposed to appear as complete white and then I can just sample that area to get that correctly white balanced so this is much easier solution than actually doing it on camera so I prefer using this method of getting the custom value off of the computer and then the camera will basically register that as well later on however I just need to go back to daylight and I like that that overall white balancing so I'm gonna go with that and over here I can choose different focus method face detection plus tracking autofocus versus zone autofocus one point autofocus they could all be changed and then I can just click on a screen to change the focus points but in my case or at least in my scenarios face detection works perfectly and then movie servo autofocus could be turned on and off currently it is checked and it's in the off position and it tracks me quite well so I'm gonna leave it at that and then sound recording I can change the microphone volume here and there are different things that you can do but I mainly just change this slider to get a correct level for my audio and then I can look at the histogram if I wanted to I don't typically look at RGB values rather I just look at the brightness so that I can kind of gauge what is going on in my picture and then I can click on this record button so that I can start recording and then you'll see the counter that shows up up here and that is very small so I actually have missed that many times I wish this was either a lot bigger or the entire frame just turn into red to let me know that it is recording and shooting otherwise I actually have intended to stop shooting therefore I clicked on it or maybe missed clicked it or something like that and then the counter keeps on going and I realized later on that I have been recording all of this time or sometimes I intend to record and I miss click again and then basically I have not been shooting so those things have happened before I wish the indicator was a bit bigger but yeah that's what I get and you might have noticed but it does indicate it is shooting full HD 24 frames per second with IPB settings and when you are not shooting I can go here and then see a couple of other indicators such as level my level is slightly off but it's okay it seems fine to me and then I can have the auto rotate dialed in versus not if not then I can just rotate the screen which is 
Probably not necessarily in my case because everything is correctly oriented and then I can have the AF point display on and off like that. It's helpful for me to be able to see it. Obviously that's not gonna show up on the actual recording, but I'm trying to judge the overall picture by looking at it and it is very useful to know which one it is being focused onto. So if I wanna switch over to the bottles over there, I can click on that and it's gonna focus on it. And basically my face became out of focus or focus on the camera and then my face is going to be out of focus and then I can just go back to my face and that is going to track very well. And mind you, Canon M50 does not have eye focus on the movie mode, so that's not showing up on the screen. However, if you connect other cameras that is capable of doing eye focus on the movie mode, then it will also focus on my eye as well. And then you can click on this to change different ratio for your photos. You can certainly set it to one by one if you wanna be trendy on Instagram. But for the YouTube thumbnails, it'll be 16 by nine. So I would like to keep it at that. And when I am done shooting the videos, I can actually close this. And then there's gonna be a dialogue that shows up and it's gonna ask me download recorded movie files. So it automatically asks the files that I have just shot. And then I can basically click download and it's gonna prompt me, hey, you got this one. And then it highlights the destination folder. So I can just go ahead and download that specific file. So I can have that immediately on my PC. PC, which is very very helpful but also if I have shot elsewhere or I just have lost my shots and then I can click on that and then basically that's gonna bring up the screen over here where it shows you all the recordings as well as the photos and then I can simply click on the first photos that I need or the video that I need and then hold down shift button and then actually click on the next one and then it's gonna ask me if I want to select multiple images yes and then I can either download or if I wish to just clear my space by removing some of these then I can just go down probably like an older one and then select that select multiple images and click on this icon to delete them or I can just kind of zoom out so that I can see more thumbnails versus less but bigger picture. And here I can click on preferences to adjust other preferences that we have seen before or quit altogether or go back to main window. And if I go back to main window, I can go back to remote shooting. And by the way, this is basically where you just work and I can click on this one. And on the other functions, I can hit quick preview and then I can have this window open here and under the photo, I can hover over the shutter button to lock on the focus. And then as I hit this or click this, then it's gonna count two seconds as I have the drive mode as a two second timer. So there you go. It's gonna count and then take the picture. It was not correctly shot since I kind of blinked on that one. So let's go ahead and take another one. There you go, let's say that's good enough. And that photo has already been saved on my desktop as per the request. And as I hover over the shutter button, it's gonna calculate the overall exposure as well as dialing a correct ISO if it was on auto. So everything does feel familiar as far as the overall shutter and change of value that are located in here. And because M50 doesn't support audio level viewing on the camera screen, it's actually really useful to be able to see the level on the screen like that. And in terms of the overall Canon video setup, if you're not using the continuous power with DC coupler, then you may need to watch out for your camera battery running out. Because in my experience, Canon M6 Mark II does not charge whilst it is on, nor M50 supporting in-body charging. So in either case, it will eventually run out of battery. Since my shooting sessions are not usually more than two hours and it is not continuously shooting over those period, therefore I have not really had that incident where I completely run out of battery. Also, I do have a couple of spare batteries if I really need to charge up or switch out the battery to the camera. So 
yeah, I haven't had that issue yet, but I am mindful of it and I wanted you guys to be mindful of it as well. Obviously, the battery slash charging issue may only matter for your specific camera and your specific scenario. Anyways, I think I've covered enough for Canon EOS utility. Okay, moving on to the Sony side, the Imaging Edge desktop is a software that you need download it from their website. I'll leave a link in the description. Once I had installed the initial software, I had to download another package within the Imaging Edge desktop. There are other functions such as Viewer and Edit once you start that application, but we are only interested in on the remote feature. So let's go ahead and press Start. Prior to connecting your camera to your computer, make sure that your camera has been set to PC remote function on. And once you have that as on and have the camera turned on and connected to your computer, although it somewhat covers the screen, which I find it a little bit odd that it is kind of designed to do that. I can set it to where it needs to be. And then I'm going to see the name of the camera listed on this dialog over here. And if it doesn't show up correctly, then I can actually refresh it to see if it shows up. And once that shows up correctly, I can double click it to connect to my camera and you'll immediately see yourself in the picture. And on top, there are file tools, camera settings and help. But if you go to the tools and settings, there are a couple of things that you can change. And I don't think we need to do that just now. So I'm going to close that. And from top left, currently we are in the remote mode and we can go to the viewer by clicking on this as well. But the focus magnifier is currently set to off. But if you really want to zoom in to the picture 1% and I can just set it to a different area, let's say my face over here and then click on that to just really look at the pores of my face. Let's not do that. And then rotate the screen just like you did on Canon. And either you can show the overlay on top of your picture by picking a file or show the guides or the grid if you want to show that kind of thing. But I'm going to turn that off because it's not useful for me. And then for the photo modes, you can actually click on this one to view the shot with the effects on. However, I don't want to see this and actually want to be able to see the picture as how I will be taking the picture. So I'll disable that. And then if I disable the live view, then basically I won't be able to see anything and I want to see that. So let's turn that on. And on the top right, you'll notice that there is a battery as well as the indicator that it is currently charging, which is very good because it is currently at 73%, probably because I consumed it from 100% to 73 by shooting my Canon session. And it is going to remain that way. It is not going to charge more nor drain further because it is being continuously powered by USB cable. I think if I have a USB-C connection, it may drive a bit more power, therefore slowly charge up. But currently it is going to just park at 73%, not really gain more or lose more. So this is definitely a difference with the Canon cameras because Canon cameras don't really charge when the camera is on. Yeah, Sony is definitely better in this department where it is able to continuously power as well as charging over USB ports. And going down here is a ZV-E10 connected noted here. And then in terms of the shooting menu, you have automatic exposure lock. So you can press that to make sure your overall picture doesn't change in terms of the exposure value, although I have nothing auto set there, so it's not going to change. However, I can press this to incur the half press of shutter. So it just locks on on there. And then I can just press this button to take picture. And it's taking two seconds, just like the Canon's, because I like to do that for my thumbnail shots so I can gauge. And you'll notice that my picture is a lot sharper than what you were previewing. And I can immediately see this. And then this file was already saved onto the file path that I have designated, which is my desktop. The file name is set to auto and it has a prefix as well as a starting number. So that has been all located onto my desktop, which is good. And then there is a video capturing mode. So if I press that, then you'll notice that the picture mode changes to 
to video and then start shooting video over the camera and I can just monitor that there and everything is nice but you'll see that recorded video will be saved to your camera's memory card instead so it doesn't save over to my PC, I have to get it off of memory card. I will get into that a bit, but there's not going to be any dialogue that's going to show up if I stop the video, which is disappointing because even if I go to the viewer, the camera is just not available. I can't look into my memory card. So the only way for me to actually get this video file that I just shot is to either take out the SD card and then put it into my computer to read it or change the setting in the camera, which I had changed the PC remote setting to on. I actually need to turn that off for this camera to be recognized as a mass storage where I can see the files inside of the camera. So yeah, I don't know why perhaps Sony haven't thought of this, but when I shoot videos off of remote shooting, it's kind of difficult to get the files off of your camera. Anyways, moving on, I had collapsed this one, which I like this feature of Sony where you can collapse a couple of dialogues or actually change position if you want to. And there is an interval timer shooting option, which I'm not really interested in for this video function, as well as this dialogue here. So I just collapse that and then move on to the main settings. And again, as I have noted, there is a mode available, which is a manual photo shooting, but I can actually change that to video shooting by going here and then clicking on here. And you'll see all of the modes are available in here. So that's definitely different from Canon's where you're just bounded to one single mode that your physical dial has been set to. Whereas here you can freely switch to different modes. However, there's a bit of a delay whenever you switch modes. And actually that's true for most of their values. So when you click on it, it takes a bit for it to stick and then it will follow. And another behavior that was kind of confusing is the fact that yeah, you can kind of put this anywhere on your screen. I guess that's a okay thing, but you may cover the thing that you need. So you gotta dodge or you have to click on X. So when you change the value, it doesn't go away. You have to either click on different value or just click out, which is kind of cumbersome in my opinion. And I found this trick where you just double click on it and it goes away. Anyways, I'm going to the shutter speed. You can just scroll down, up and down if you want, and then set the shutter speed that you want, and then double click again to set that, or just click on these arrows to go different values of increments and the aperture value as well. I'm gonna stay at the lowest number possible. And then for ISO, I've bumped it up to 500 as my aperture is at 3.5, but if I wanna increase it more, I can do that. It's a bit quicker than the mode change. And if I set this to auto, which is strangely on the bottom of the list, and it gets smaller number as you go down, it's kind of weird. But um, if you are in the auto, then you can change the exposure value to designate the an ISO value. But in my case, I prefer to actually change the ISO value over changing the exposure values. And then also flash is available, although I don't have a flash for this camera, so it's kind of meaningless. And then moving on to the sub settings, and those things are grayed out because I'm currently in the video mode. So I can go to the manual exposure of photo mode and those values will become available. And then I can go from JPEG to RAW, but I prefer to stay at JPEG for thumbnail purposes. Those don't need to be extra raw capable and I can also set it to fine or standard, but extra fine is good, I like that. And then size is L or large, and those are changeable there. And then I can set different aspect ratio for the photo, so I can actually have it as one by one to be trendy as Instagram or something like that. But 16 by nine is a thumbnail picture size for the YouTube, so I'm gonna keep it at that. And then there's a drive mode. It took two seconds for it to take pictures and then the picture effect is available here and then white balancing I have set it as daylight but you can also do auto white balancing which I think it's too blue so let's go ahead and put it back to this one and then the range optimizer
optimizer is available in different values. I prefer to keep it off and keep the post-processing all on my computer, but I know some people like the auto version, so you can set that if you would like to. And then here is a focus area that you can set it to. Currently, I'm on the wide setting for pictures and then the metering mode is at center for pictures and then the focus mode is single shot autofocus and then the flash are kind of irrelevant on this specific one and then I can actually set different camera settings for still image being saved either on PC only versus PC and camera and camera only and then I can set the image size and you can also toggle between autofocus and manual focus and when you are in manual and then you can just set different focus area by clicking on these things it's kind of arbitrary so it's kind of hard to know where you are at so I'll just snap back to auto so that my camera finds my face and then I can go back to a video mode and once I am in the video mode the sub settings kind of change so there's obviously no drive mode available focus mode will only limit to either continuous autofocus or manual focus for that matter and then here is a focus area that are available for you and I want to note this the fact that I have nothing shown on the screen where the camera is focusing on it's obviously tracking my face and it is not visible on the screen so I have no way of of knowing other than judging the fact that my face is the sharpest and if I look at the camera screen it actually is tracking my this eye over here so I can kind of see that let me show you that over the USB wire that is currently covering it is tracking my eye and I am seeing the microphone value as well which is good but it is tracking my eye and it is not showing on the computer so quite disappointing since I can't really monitor that at all let's say I want to showcase my camera over here focus on this but no it's gonna focus on my face over the product actually there is a designated button for it on Sony ZV E10 which is a trash button on the back so I have to press that and once I press that then it will prioritize products or my hand over my face so I can do that but every time I swing my hand around it is going to focus on my hand over my face which is kind of annoying because I often do talking head style video and I may hold some sort of product on my hand and now it is out of focus off of my face even though I wasn't intending to show you this product I want you to focus on my face and I can't click on my face to focus on my face Face. rather it is just going to bypass that and always focus on the product rather so I wish I can just click on the screen and be able to focus on different area perhaps background or my face and switch focus but that's just not available on the Sony side one thing that you can do is to actually set it to flexible spot or any of the flexible area methods so medium large or expand the spot and I can just set it to a small area and then I can actually click on the picture to focus so that is kind of available yeah only with these and then these things don't track so it doesn't track my eye as I go off it is going to just focus on the back rather and if I come back to it it's just gonna stay on there so it doesn't really track it just stays on that specific spot rather and same thing for the large it is going to just focus to the back rather so that is a bit annoying and I need to switch back to the wide focus mode for it to snap back onto my face or turn off the product showcase mode entirely so that it always locks on my face which to Sony's credit it auto focuses very very well and it doesn't lose track of it if it is locked on but when I want to switch over to something else it is kind of troublesome so whilst I'm trying to explain about a product now I've got to go over here change focus and then when I'm done talking about it I let go of it and it is still focusing onto the wall rather than my face so I gotta go back and then lock on my face and then if I move away slightly then it's gonna focus onto the wall therefore I wanna go back to the wide mode so that it locks on my face and now if I hold up another product then I've got to instead of clicking on just my hand or product I've got to click on this and that and if I move it away then I'm out of luck so 
I don't know, it's very cumbersome. And here I have no way of telling where it is currently focusing on. And it kind of defeats the purpose of having a remote session where you see the picture on a larger screen because you can't really tell. Whereas all the information is available on the tiny little screen of the camera. Anyways, I think that is enough of rent. Going further down, there is a histogram available. You can turn off a couple of values. And then again, the save settings are available in here. So basically, yeah, that is covering the entire thing of Sony's couple of complaints there. So in terms of the conclusion, having to try out both Sony and Canon cameras in their remote shooting softwares, I feel like neither of them are perfect. Many of the Canon cameras don't charge whilst they are shooting and their live view doesn't have as much resolution as Sony's or at least in my finding. And I have to change a shooting mode by physically changing the dial on the camera rather than being able to remotely change that. And on Sony, however, it feels almost broken as simply it doesn't autofocus correctly and not being able to see them is basically defeating the purpose of remote shooting because I want to be able to see where I'm focused at even if my camera is kind of far away and tucked away from me where I can't see it. Neither the being able to click on the screen to change the focus and track it continuously it just stays on the same spot. So I don't know why the touch behavior of the Sony camera doesn't transfer onto the remote shooting software because I can see the focal point on the camera very well and it tracks very well. If I am within the reach, then I can certainly touch on the screen and change the focus and it tracks it. And also not being able to directly transfer your videos onto your PC is a bit of a hassle of workflow. Moving the SD card back and forth between your camera and PC seems a uh, unnecessary hassle that you have to go through as well as changing the value in the menu before you connect the camera onto your computer for it to be recognized as either a remote shooting camera versus the mass storage where you can look into your file of the memory card seems to be a necessary process for people who's looking to do this. I'm sorry that this was just a bit too much of a rent than how to or the comparison of the two softwares, but I felt it was necessary to get this kind of voice out there so that people who develops this kind of software is able to at least hear the opinions of different people using their things in different ways. And yeah, I feel like they could fix this. And Sony and Canon, if you guys want to reach me out, I'll be happy to talk to you. I've also done a bit of rant on these two cameras as well as Canon M50 in my previous video. So if you have liked this video, you might also like that video because I was a bit ranty, nitpicky about different things. Anyways, maybe I was just so used to Canon where I took things as granted, but there were too many things that are on the Sony side where it just broke apart and didn't feel as functional and quite disruptive to my overall shooting workflow. And whilst I have concluded that Sony ZV-E10 is a better camera than M50 and M6 Mark II, I decided to stick with Canon because of these remote shooting issues. I hope this kind of makes sense to you. And if you have liked this content, please like this video and consider subscribing to my channel to continue watching these type of videos. Thank you so much for watching. As always, I'll see you next time. Bye.